Hello, wrestling fans. After a quite a lengthy absence, it is now time for Volume 3 of Step Through the Ropes. Many have said that when Cowboy Bill Watts was placed in charge of WCW in the year 1992, that may say it was a huge fail. Well, behind the scenes wise, possibly. Due to the fact that I know he tried to get wrestlers to sign new contracts and take for less money. Which did which which soured so many people. However, on the air or in the ring, things seemed okay. I thought it was actually a very good year for WCW in the in ring wise. But we have to go back to the beginning. In January of 1992, Jim Hurd, as I called or as I called him, Jim Turd, who didn't know crap about wrestling, was uh, I don't know if he was shown the door or he decided to quit. Because the company had been failing under his uh, management, shall we say. And he had been in charge since like 1989 or 90. Hurd was replaced by Turner, Ted Turner employee uh, Kip Fry. And my understanding, uh, Kip, many said was a nice guy, but did not understand the wrestling business. Uh, he did offer like bonus money. For those who work for those who worked hardest on the sh on shows. Now, also that very month, um, WWE had their first huge show of the year, which was Clash of the Champions eighteen. And that very night, very night, we saw making his WCW debut. Jesse the Body Ventura, who joined Jim Ross on commentary for the main event of that very show. And uh, although by the beginning of 1992, Paulie Dangerously, a.k.a. Paul Heyman, had put together a group known as the Dangerous Alliance, consisting of Medusa, Ravishing Rick Rude, Stunning Steve Austin, Larry Zabisco, Beautiful Bobby Eaton of Midnight Express fame, and Arn Anderson. Now, to me, the Dangerous Alliance were kind of a precursor, almost a precursor, to the New World Order, which came along a few years later, where Paul would, Paul e. would say, you know, we're going to tear down WCW brick by brick and buy it for a cheap price. And that all actually began at Halloween Havoc 1991, when Rude unmasked himself as a Halloween phantom. He, Medusa, aligned themselves with Heyman, and the others joined as time went on, and like, less than a month after Halloween Havoc, Rude had defeated Sting to win the United States Championship. But, at this very clash of champions, the Dangerous Alliance were only featured in two matches, as Anderson, Eaton, and Zabisco were defeated by Ron Simmons, Dustin Rhodes, and Barry Windham, and in the main event, Rude and Austin were defeated by Sting and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. But that very month, the... Uh, Anderson and Eaton won the World Tag Team Championship from Steamboat and uh, Dustin Rhodes. And Stunning Steve Austin had been television champion already by the time he joined the group. Also at that very clash of champions was the first appearance of Vinny Vegas, who of course many know that was uh, Kevin Nash, who had previously been, had been repackaged from his previous gimmick of Oz. And then also that very month, in my, in what my my in my very opinion, the worst faction in wrestling history, the York Foundation, I called them the Yuck Foundation, had crumbled. That group consi was uh, consisted of Terry Taylor, who was called Terrence Taylor, Ricky Morton, who had, of Rock and Roll Express fame, they, they was renamed Richard Morton. And Wildfire Tommy Rich, Nick renamed Thomas Rich, and also a part of the group was the head of, their head of security, uh, Mr. Hughes. Well, in the summer of 1991, Hughes left the York Foundation to become the bodyguard of Lex Luger for his first run as WCW World Champion. But Terry Taylor, but they were all managed by Alexandra York, the future Terry Runnels, unless she had already married Dustin by that time. And... Taylor got tired of of uh, your Alexandra, and I forgot what happened, and we all thought he was turning face, but turns out he remained a heel, but was repackaged as 
the tailor-made man where he basically ripped off Ted DiBiase's tearaway tuxedos. Yeah. And by the way, as far as Terry Taylor goes, there will that will be another video for another for another time, folks. Okay, well, that's other for the month of January. Then the month of February, um, I'm not going to go through all, through all of this, but we'll get to the part where the cowboy came in, folks. But in the month of February, it was Super Brawl 2 pay-per-view in which um, Lex Luger lost the World Heavyweight Championship to Sting. And after, the sh after that show, Luger bolted for the the infamous WBF, which is the World Bodybuilding Federation, which was one of Vince McMahon's huge failed experiments. And and after the show at the press conference, Sting was uh, was being uh, asked questions, to, only to be confronted by ravishing Rick Rude, and Sting, Rude wanted to offer a toast. I don't know if it was champagne or what kind of drink he had, and Sting tells Rude, I'm not drinking with you, and they get into it, and the rest of Dangerous Alliance comes along. And that prompted um, Nikita Koloff, who had feuded with Sting in, nine, the in the previous year. Koloff was hitting Russian sickles on many Dangerous Alliance members. Then in the month of March, the cowboy Bill Watts uh, took charge of the company. I don't know if Kip Fry stepped down or he got fired. And also of, notice, of notable things that month, well... In the month of March, the debut debuts of Scotty Flamingo, who later became Raven, and <laughs> J.T. Southern, who kind of looked like, I guess you could say he was a Brett Michaels reject. For those who don't know, Brett Michaels is the lead singer of the rock band Poison, and S Southern came in and to feud with Van Hammer, who was a damn, who looked like Sammy Hagar of Van Halen fame. And I do remember watching... Well, Hammer won a match on World Championship Wrestling, which was the flagship WWE program on Saturday nights at 6.05 p.m. on TBS. And uh, Southern came out, and, and Southern tells Hammer, hey, can you play that, actually play that guitar? Because Southern would, like, play his guitar live to the ring for his matches. I don't know if he really was, folks, but when Southern walked away, Hammer says to Jim Ross, oh, What's his name? J.T. Southern? What does the J.T. stand for? Just talk? Okay. But then, a week after that very show, it was the month of April, and it was, um, the, the rebranded, the show was rebranded as WCW Saturday Night as of April of 1992, I mean, that was a flagship broadcast for World Championship Wrestling for so many years until Monday Nitro came along. And then it went from being, and then I dubbed it WCW Crapper Day Night. Because the show ended up sucking so bad as time went on. But also in the month of April, uh, during a house show at the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia, Sting took on the late Vader for the World Heavyweight Championship and I understand some point in the match, Sting got injured, and I don't know how it happened, and Vader got disqualified for pushing the referee. And also, that at that time, Ole Anderson returned to the company after being fired in late 1990, but Ole wasn't brought in as a booker. Ole, <coughs> Ole was brought in as a referee. In the month of May, uh, WCW has their Wrestle War 92 pay-per-view, and had it featured an awesome War Games main event, which saw Sting Squadron, consisting of the Stinger himself, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, Barry Windham, Dustin Rhodes, and Nakita Koloff, as they defeated the Dangerous Alliance, Ravishing Rick Root, Stunning Steve Austin, Beautiful Bobby Eaton, Art Anderson, and Larry Zbysko with Pauly Dangerously and Medusa at ringside. Now... The ending of this match, Z Zabisco took like, uh, had unhooked one of the turnbuckles from the ring post, and he went to swing it at Sting, but he missed, and he ended up hitting Bobby Eaton in the arm, and Sting eventually took care, took advantage of the situation, and that was pretty much, pretty much that was the beginning of the end of the Dangerous Alliance, because 
that was the uh, seed planter for, for Zabisco to bolt from the group. Because there was talk of Scott Hall, who wrestled as the Diamond, who was the Diamond Stud. He was going to replace Zabisco in that group and feud with Dustin Rhodes. But Hall, unfortunately, bolted from the company and he went off to the WWF as Razor Ramon. Also, that very, I don't know if it was the very same pay-per-view, but make it debuting for WCW was the Super Invader. Not the video game, but Super Invader, who was a masked man built from Bangkok, Thailand. It was actually um, the late Ray Fernandez, who previously wrestled as Hercules, and the mighty Hercules in the WWF. Huh. All right, the month of June arrives, and we have... Uh, the beginning of the NWA, rec the National Wrestling Alliance Resurrection, as at Clash of the Champions 19, which took place June 16th. I may have gotten the date wrong that year. And they had the first round matches of the of, of, a, of a tag title tournament to crown brand new NWA tag team champions. And on that, and in the first the first round went like this. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat and Nikita Koloff defeated Joe and Dean Malenko. Jushin Thunder Liger and the late Brian Pillman defeated Chris Benoit and Beef Wellington. I think Beef has since passed, or is it Biff Wellington? One of them. I think he has since passed away. Not to be confused with uh, Beef Wellington from the International Wrestling Syndicate in Canada, who was known for the ass punch and the E. coli finishers. Uh, other matches, Dustin Rhodes and Barry Wyndham defeated Arn Anderson and Bobby Eaton. Rick Rude and Steve Austin defeated Buff, uh, Marcus, before he was Buff, Marcus Alexander Bagwell and the Z-Man, who was the late Tom Zink. Uh, the Fabulous Freebirds defeated the Silver Kings. Uh, Hiroshi Hase and Akira Nogami defeated the Headhunters. Oh, and the Miracle Violence Connection. Terry Bam Bam Gordy and Dr. Death Steve Williams rest their souls. They defeated the O'Days in the first round. And I don't know, did I get every first round match? Let's see. Well, actually, no. Unfortunately, the Steiner brothers, Rick and Scott, were scheduled to wrestle Miguel Perez and El Bariqua. But they, I guess, didn't show up or they did some angle where Gordy and Williams beat them up before the tournament even speed up. Bariqua and Perez before the tournament even started and Cowboy Bill Watts was in the ring and he says, you know, you know, we thought we were going to have to wait for the Great American Bash for these guys, these teams to face each other. But Bill decided, no, we're going to let them fight each other tonight. And that main event of the show, which saw the Miracle Violence Connection defeat the Steiner brothers. And as a result, they ended up in the semifinals of the tournament. Just days later, WCW had its first ever Beach Blast pay-per-view. Now, many say this was like the best WCW pay-per-view under the Bill Watts regime. And this very show, we saw Ricky the Dragon Steamboat defeat United States champion Rick Rude in a non-title 30-minute Iron Man match. The Steiners and the Miracle Violence, Collect Miracle Violence Collection. Connection, sorry. Connection, not collection. Connection. No L's. Uh, they went to a 30-minute draw. Sting defeated Cactus Jack in a Falls Count Anywhere match. There was a... Uh, oh, a six-man tag. Nikita Koloff, Dustin Rhodes, and Barry Windham defeated Arn Anderson, Bobby Eaton, and Larry Zabisco with Ole Anderson was the referee. Yeah. Oh, and... Yeah, also on this very show, Scotty Flamingo defeated Brian Pillman to win the light heavyweight championship. And it should be, and also in the month of June, the late Dick Slater and the Barbarian won the United States Tag Team Championship from the fabulous Freebirds. And within the next month, the U.S. Tag Team title was pretty much deactivated. That was kind of cool back then, WCW and NWA having a secondary tag team title division. Then in the month of July, a house show in uh, the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia, 
Uh, the late Brad Armstrong defeated Sky Flamingo to win the light heavyweight title. The Miracle Violence Connection defeated the Steiner Brothers to win the WCW World Tag Team title. And then a week later was the Great American Bash pay-per-view where Vader defeated Sting to win the, his first World Heavyweight Championship. And also the Miracle Violence Connection wound up winning the, wound up, uh, winning the tournament to become the new NWA Tag Team Champions. And as a result of the victory... Uh, they were billed as the it was billed as the unified tag team championship with both WCW and NWA tag team belts together. I mean, even though they had four belts and all. Okay, from there, in the month of August, on August the second, at a house show in Baltimore, Maryland, during a match pitting Nikita Koloff and Ravishing Rick Root for the United States Championship, Cactus Jack interferes, which eventually prompts Sting to come out and make the save. But then out from the crowd comes Jake the Snake Roberts, who had not wrestled since WrestleMania 8 earlier that year in the WWF, where he was defeated by The Undertaker. Roberts had attacked Sting, executed two DDTs on a steel chair, and because of that, Sting was unable to wrestle Vader for the world title later that night. So they have an in-ring in -ring drawing to determine a, a new challenge for Vader that night. It was the All-American Ron Simmons. And Simmons ended up making history, defeating Vader to win the WWE World Championship and becoming the first African-American wrestler to be World's Heavyweight Champion. Also that month, Eric Watts debuted, and many shit on him. And then, over in Japan, there was a two, or was it three, two or three night tournament? in which for to crown a new NWA World's Heavyweight Champion. And it came it was a mixture of WCW and New Japan talent on one show. And in the final match of the tournament, Masahiro Chono defeated Rick Rude to become the new NWA champion. Then in the month of September, WCW had its 20th Clash of the Champions, celebrating 20 years of wrestling on the TBS network. And this very show, here we saw Ricky the Dragon Steamboat defeat Steve Austin in a no-DQ match to win the television championship. And as a result of, uh, also, Paul E. Dangerously was locked in a cage suspended above the ring during the match. Bobby Eaton and Arn Anderson, who were now under the tutelage of Michael Hayes of Fabulous Freebird fame, they defeated uh, Greg Valentine and the late Dick Slater with Larry Zabisco in their corner. Ron Simmons defeated uh, Cactus Jack to retain the World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, the Barbarian and Butch Reed, substituting for Dan Spivey, defeated Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham. And in an elimination tag team matchup, Jake Roberts, Rick Rude, Vader, and Super Invader had defeated Sting, Nikita Koloff, and the Steiner Brothers. Uh, this very show was also notable for... for... Um, Bill Watts stripping Brad Armstrong of the light heavyweight championship because Armstrong had injured his knee wrestling in Japan around late July of that year and was stripped of the belt and said they were going to do a tournament to crown a new champion. And Brad was being interviewed by Jesse Ventura, only interrupted by a scheduled opponent, Brian Pillman, and thus began Pillman's heel turn. Also in the month of September, Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham dethrone the Miracle Violence Connection to become the Unified World Tag Team Champions. In the month of October was the Halloween Havoc pay-per-view, and Terry Bam Bam Gordy, I don't know if he quit or had gotten fired from the company because he was scheduled to uh, team with Steve Dr. Death Williams to challenge Rhodes and Wyndham for the tag belts, but Gordy gone and he was replaced by Steve, Steve Austin, who ironically was born with the name Steve Williams. Not to be confused with Dr. Death, obviously. But that very pay-per-view was headlined by the first ever <laughs> Spin the Wheel, Make the Deal match. <laughs> I do not know who the fuck came up with that idea. But the match pitted Sting against Jake the Snake Roberts, where there were various 
match types on the wheel. And during the very pay-per-view, they spun the, the Sting spun the wheel and it stopped on Coal Miner's glove. That's where they stuck a Coal Miner's glove, held, hung it up on a pole that was attached to one of the ring posts. Uh, many shit on this whole pay-per-view anyway, because uh, here were the other... Sting defeated Jake Roberts to win this, by the way. But you had Ron Simmons to retain his world title, defeating the Barbarian. Um, actually, yeah. Prior to this pay-per-view, um, Bill Watts uh, tells Rick Rude he was going to have to... Not only he would cha defend his United States chariot against Nikita Koloff. Nikita Koloff... Because Rude had already been set to challenge uh, Masahiro Chono for the NWA title. But Paul Heyman like pulled one over on everybody's eyes and decided, unless there was Medusa, I don't know how the, f the heck it happened. But Rude did wrestle Chono. Win one by Rude won by disqualification because I know the two referees of the match were Harley Race and Kensuke Sasaki. But and, and instead of Rude, it wound up being Vader defeating Nikita Koloff to allow Rude to retain the United States Championship. And Medusa, Vader, and Racer are being interviewed by Tony Schiavone, interrupted by Paul Heyman, and that's where Heyman fired Medusa from the Dangerous Alliance, and, you know, Heyman, I guess, was trying to be like the 90s version of Andy Kaufman. And I'll get back to that shortly. But also in the month of October, Scott Steiner defeated Ricky Steamboat to win the television championship. The month of November comes around, and we have, and in the month of November, WCW kicked off a new concept called the King, a King of Cable tournament. And the first round matches were were as follows: Rick Rude defeated Barry Windham, Sting defeated Brian Pillman. Vader defeated Tony Atlas. And Dustin Rhodes defeated the Barbarian. Uh, Barbarian, initially, uh, Dustin was going to wrestle Jake the Snake Roberts in the tournament, but I understand, I don't know if Jake quit, got fired, and there was, or if it was true that he went to, had checked himself into the Betty Ford Clinic. I don't know what, what story was true, but Jake was gone from WCW. Uh, then we had, um, also in the, we had uh, the Clash of Champions 21 which uh, saw the late Brian Pillman fake a knee injury as he was going to wrestle Brad Armstrong. And Pillman duped everybody when he swung the crutch and hit Brad in that knee that was, I think, injured earlier in the year. And, and for this, and for what happened next, Christian Miracle. I uh, wonder where you, would, you are, you are, or you were. You would probably sin this, this part. Because a bunch of referees came out to stop Pillman from beating Brad up. And one of the referees said, Pillman disqualified. You can't do that. And Brian's reaction, you can't disqualify me. The match hasn't even started yet. You want to wrestle Armstrong? Come on, let's get on. So Brian enters the ring and, and Brad, is he's trying. the referees are trying to stop Brad. and say, hey man, you're hurt. And Brad says, ring the bell. And the match was underway and Pillman defeated Armstrong in under a minute. Other matches that took place that night, um, Eric Watts and Kensuke Sasaki defeated Bobby Eaton and Arn Anderson. Sky Flamingo beat Johnny B. Bad in a boxing match. Ron Simmons teamed up with the debuting Two Cold Scorpio as they defeated Cactus Jack, Tony Atlas, and the Barbarian in what was billed as a ghetto odds match. <sighs> I don't think they, there was ever a match like that titled ever again, and thank goodness. Probably some racist fuck came up with that, and I and it may or may not have been Bill Watts, folks. Uh, oh, also that night, Sting defeated Rick Rude by decision in the semifinal of the King of Cable tournament. The ringside judges were... Larry Zbysko, Ole Anderson, and the late Hiro Matsuda.
Oh, and the, the night ended with uh, Ricky the Dragon, Steamboat, and Shane Douglas defeating Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham to win the World Tag Team Championship. And uh, after the match, and what happened during the matchup, uh, Ricky Steamboat went for a leapfrog, and Rhodes accidentally, his head actually inadvertently headbutt Steamboat in the groin. And Steamboat's down, and Rhodes is right there, and Wyndham's telling Rhodes to pin him. And Wyndham tagged him, tagged in, and he kept giving Steamboat inverted atomic drops, and Rhodes and Wyndham, they started going at it while the match was still going on. Steamboat, in the meantime, tagged Douglas, gave Barry Wyndham the belly-to-belly -belly suplex and pinned him. And after the match, Wyndham is yelling for Dustin to come back to the ring, and Wyndham does a number on Dustin and ends up a heel again. And also, Wyndham attacks Steamboat and Douglas backstage and the month of December arrives and uh, unfortunately Rick Rude had suffered a neck injury and they were going to begin a tournament in January of 1993 where the winner would be number one contender to the U.S. belt but if Rude's injury prevented him from getting back in the ring in time Rude would be stripped of the belt also that month we had Starcade 1992, the second year year of Lethal Lot Battle Bowl and Lethal Lottery, and we ended up with uh, quite a good show as Masahiro Chono beat the Great Muda to retain the NWA belt. Sting defeated Vader in the finals of the first and only King of Cable tournament. Ugh. Uh, there was um, hmm. uh, Ron Simmons, who was scheduled to wrestle Rick Rue for the world title. Simmons took on Dr. Death Steve Williams, where initially they were both counted out. But then, after the match, the referee changed his decision to disqualifying Williams for giving Simmons a knee to the neck off the top rope. Off the top rope. And that's another thing I forgot to mention. Bill Watts had banished top rope moves right after he came into power. But thankfully to the WCW hotline, the fans voted like 88% said bring back the top rope rules. So kudos to that. Um, Great Muda, by the way, won the Battle Bowl at the end of the night. And then two nights later at a house show in Baltimore, Maryland, Vader defeated Ron Simmons to regain the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. And uh, although 1992, I've just gone through mostly. <coughs> mostly. I, uh, well, Bill was not, Bill Watts apparently wasn't done yet. January 1993, I forgot the exact date. But it was Clash of the Champions 22, which was to be headlined by an eight-man tag team Thunder Cage match. Now, for some reason, Van Hammer, Bill Watts, the star of the show, announced that Van Hammer was injured. I don't know if he just didn't show up that night or what the deal was. And he also announced that Bill announced that his son Eric had been suspended for that for that night because he was going to wrestle Cactus Jack because they did this angle where Eric was. Uh, giving a little girl an autograph, and then Arn Anderson appeared out of his, drove out, came out of his car. Anderson and Watts, Eric Watts, go at it. Eric puts Anderson in the DDT. No, I'm sorry, not DDT, I'm sorry, the STF. And uh, the police arrived, and they ended up arresting Eric. And uh, that angle was eventually dropped, and you'll find out shortly why. And also, this was uh, also this particular clash was also remembered for a few other things, but I'll get to that shortly. But as I said, Van Hammer was injured or not and didn't make the show. Um, a few nights earlier, aired on W78 event, Cactus Jack and Paul Orndorff went out to see who would replace Rick Rude on the heels team of th the Thunder Cage heel heel team of Thunder Cage. And during the match, Cactus Jack attacked Harley Race, who was at ringside for that one. And out came Vader, who attacked Cactus. Vader, Ono, and Race did a number on Cactus. Later in the show, Race makes, they pretty much make it official that Orndorff was going to take Root's place in the match. But Cactus comes out with a shovel.